cities. This is where we come together to interact, discuss, and build a prosperous future. Human is a social being. Our amazing ability to collaborate on a large scale has led us to where we are today. Cities and suburbs are at the heart of human collaboration. They are at the heart of our progress and the prime enabler for a knowledge-based economy. Welcome to this series of videos where we will introduce you to the largest open Internet of Things network in Victoria, Australia. This network is particularly built for smart cities applications. And it is delivered as part of the Northern Melbourne Smart Cities Network project, which is funded and supported by the Smart Cities and Suburbs program by the Australian Government, Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Developments and Communications. My name is Akram Al Horani. I'm a senior lecturer at RMIT University, and I will be delivering part of this video series to you. I hope you'll enjoy it with us and find it useful and interesting. First and foremost, I would like to thank the Australian Government, the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications for their generous funding for this project. This project was delivered as part of the Smart Cities and Suburb Program. This program is supporting the delivery of innovative Smart Cities project to improve livability, productivity and sustainability of cities and towns across Australia. This series of videos will introduce you to this project, Northern Melbourne Smart Cities Network Enabling Data to Drive Change. We will also introduce you to Low Power Wide Area Network, or LP1 technologies. In particular, we will focus on two technologies, primarily on the LoRaWAN, which is the technology that we have used in this project. The other technology is called MBIoT, which is basically adopted by the main telecom operators in Australia, such as Telstra, Optus, and Vodafone. We will introduce you to this technology as well for completeness. However, in this project, we have used the LoRaWAN, and we will show you why did we select this technology. These series of videos will also show you how to connect through the network and use it. It will also show you how to design and develop such networks. It will introduce you to the network management system that we have utilized and how to do verification and testing. This project is a collaboration effort between universities, councils and industry. The universities are RMIT University and Latrobe University. The councils are City of Whittlesea, Moreland City Council, Banyul City Council, Mitchell Shire Council, Nulimbing Shire Council. Industry, which done the main implementation of this project, is Minovation. The project aims to start the first steps towards smarter cities and to drive positive transformation in the delivery of services by the councils. The project has developed one of the largest open Internet of Things network in Australia across the five councils. As part of the delivery of the project, it has also implemented around 300 sensors of different types. We will see these types of sensors and the five use case scenarios that were picked up as a start. The project also implemented data analytics and visualization to make sense of these data and to drive efficiency of services and to support potential delivery of new services. There are three main deliverables in this project. The first is a large IoT network across the five councils using for around 50 gateways. The second deliverable of this project is to deploy, design and deploy around 300 sensors for five use case scenarios. The third objective is to improve the efficiency of services using data visualization and data analytics. This map shows the radio coverage across the five councils. There are two levels of coverage. There is the dark green, which means faster data rate, and the light green, which means lower data rate. Now we will go in more depth of the difference of these coverage in the upcoming videos. But for now, we just give you the highlight of the network. So as I said before, it's around 50 LoRaWAN gateways. It uses sustainable uh, power source, so the, most of the gateways are powered 
by solar cells and also it integrates with a known network called the things network so people can bring their sensors and use the network so the question is why didn't we use the existing cellular networks like the three one of the three telecom operators for example in victoria or australia where there are pros and cons of uh, both approaches so one approach is to use existing uh, network by um, telecom operators the other is to build your own network and integrate it with existing infrastructure for the using traditional cellular networks you have the pros they are widely available indeed and they cover most of the areas that were targeted for this project the modems the communication modules are widely available and they can be purchased from the market however some applications they don't have the necessary modems at the moment they are still under development for the new technology called MBIoT, which is still evolving at the moment. The cellular network also natively support user services such as billing and other services. And of course, they are supported by well-established um, network maintenance and operation. The cons of using such networks, that they are not usually designed for low power application. So you can't really run the battery for a very long time. Unless you're using this new technology, which is called MBIoT or narrowband Internet of Things, which is also provided by the three telecom operator since around two years. However, the main drawback is that you need to pay for the subscription. So you need to pay fees as you go. If you go to the LoRaWAN um, model, the pros that are very low cost, the network is comparing to the traditional cellular, it's very, very cheap to build it. It uses a free spectrum, and in particular, it uses what is called the ISM band or the Industrial Scientific Medical Band, which is free to use by the uh, public. Uh, the very good advantage here, it has a very low power consumption, which allows the battery to run for a very long time. So you don't need to send a team to replace the battery very often. It has a very simple protocol to follow, and that allows very cheap devices as well as very low power consumptions. The cons on the other hand, that interference in the ISM band might increase with time because of new users and new devices joining the band. It's similar to Wi-Fi, ISM band, Wi-Fi also uses ISM band, but at different frequencies. This is a very simplified network diagram of the implemented project. On the lower end, we have the things or the IoT devices, they are the sensors. These sensors are connected to the gateways, LoRaWAN gateways. We will see photos in the upcoming slides. The gateways are backhauled or connected via 4G cellular connection towards the internet. Through the Things network, which is an open network, Things network passes the control parameters to the management system that is implemented as part of this project. The management system is able to see the health and status of these gateways. User data, on the other hand, are passed towards an, a server, a cloud-based server that provide data analytics to the end user. In these five slides, you're going to see the extent of the coverage in the five councils. LoRaWAN supports several data rates. The highest data rate is when you're closer to the gateway. That means you get faster connection. When you are farther from the gateway, you get lower data rate, but this also can provide you larger coverage. This is similar to Wi-Fi, typical Wi-Fi you're using. In typical Wi-Fi, when you're closer to the gateway or the access point in this case, you have a high data rate. You can download and upload things faster. But when you go away, when you go further, you will have lower data rate. For the coverage purposes, we have selected two coverage or two data rate scenarios. The first is a kind of a default data rate which is called DR0. This provides around 5.4 kilobits per second. And also, we, we show the worst possible data rate, 
which also corresponds to the maximum possible coverage using 250 bits per second. It is important to note, because we are using an open ISM band, there is always interference coming from other devices. And these coverage maps are shown for an estimated 60 to 70 percent frame success rate. Frame success rate refers to the number of frames that are successfully transmitted out of the total frame. For example, if you are transmitting 100 frames a day, by average it is expected that you will get 60 to 70 updates per day from your devices. As we saw this map previously, the light green shows data rate zero, which is the lowest data rate that you could get in LoRaWAN. However, it is the largest coverage. It also shows data rate five, which is a typical usage scenario in LoRaWAN. These are three photos of some of the implemented gateways in this project. The total number of gateways is around 50. As you can see here, the gateway has a access antenna. This antenna connects to the field devices, to the sensors. And in this box, you have the uh, gateway, which is also connected to the 4G network to backhaul and relay the data. The gateway is fully powered by a solar cell, so it is self-contained and sustainable. So in the daytime, it uses solar power. At nighttime, it uses the battery. The gateway also has the ability to report the health and status to the network management system, as we saw in the previous slide about network, the network diagram. This project has also implemented around 300 sensors. These sensors are spanned over five main use case scenarios and provide data required for better services and for improved efficiency. The first application is around waste management and waste collection. So these are actually bin sensors or bin utilization sensors. We will see more about this, each of the sensors in the upcoming slides. The second type of sensor is for occupancy measurement. These sensors provide information about the number of people or an estimate on the number of people passed through a certain location, for example, or visited certain um, indoor location. Example are libraries and community hubs and parks. The third type of sensors are air quality sensors that provide continuous real-time monitoring of the air quality in a particular area. The fourth type is for water level monitoring to avoid floods or to monitor the utilization or the amount of water remaining in tanks. The fifth type of sensors is used for asset tracking, so it provides geolocation for different assets used by the council. Waste collection services vary depending on the location, the weather, and the priority of different applications. Given the absence of real-time data, the current approach results in emptying bins more often to avoid overflow and community complaints. The sensors installed by this project, such as this one in this figure, provide measurements of the depth of the bin, that is, the level of the waste inside the bin. The total number of sensors are around 120, and the data generated by these sensors allow the councils to optimize waste collection and also to be proactively collecting waste for and to provide better plans in future locations of bins. Outdoor pedestrian occupancy measurements will help the councils and communities to understand visitors' trends and to record pedestrian number in commercial streets, parks, recreational facilities, and hiking trails. Indoor pedestrian occupancy measurements will help recording visitors in libraries, communities, rooms, and, and other facilities. Both of these will help the councils to be more efficient in directing investments towards new facilities. Also, it will help the council in understanding the current utilization and the required maintenance for these facilities. For example, 
If you have a certain building or a certain room in a building that is utilized more, so probably it will require more maintenance. It will also allow you to track the asset usage in real time. Air quality sensors will provide measurements of the concentration of particulate matters in a certain region. It will also provide measurements of temperature and humidity, along with other parameters. These parameters are used to calculate the air quality index as the formula set by the local government. Air quality understanding will help us to better plan our urban areas, will increase the public confidence, will also have a better understanding of the impact of bushfires. It will also help detecting localized heat islands and then investigate the reasons for these islands. Water level sensors can measure the level of water in different scenarios. For example, it can measure the level of water in lakes or in rivers. It can also be installed inside tanks, water tanks, to measure the amount of water inside these tanks. With an automated water level monitoring system, council staff will no longer need to visit each location to inspect water levels. These sensors will automatically detect drops in water levels, which will also initiate action from councils. When sensors report an, an increase in water levels, council staff can go visit the specific location and ensure public safety. These smart sensors will allow councils, councils to proactively close parks and footpaths when they, cause, when they are hazardous to the public safety. Having these trends of water level will assist the councils in making case for infrastructure modification and improvements. Geolocation sensors or asset tracking sensors will allow the councils to have real-time information on the location of the equipments and different assets. This in turn will allow the optimization for the utilization rates and for protecting various types of powered and unpowered assets, which are vital for the management of council physical resources. Having this data will dramatically reduce the outlay, cost, the scheduling challenges, and will also will al allow these assets to be managed in conjunction with nearby councils. There are 48 sensors in this project that are, di that are distributed among the councils. The project has successfully reached its final stage, achieving the largest open Internet of Things network deployment in Victoria. The network aims to enable smarter cities and to drive positive changes. It has been a wonderful opportunity to work in such a collaborative team. Every participating organization, every member, worked hand in hand towards the successful delivery of this project. Along the way, there were indeed many challenges. However, with the dedication of the team's members and their hard work, we have managed to overcome these challenges. This is mainly attributed to the team's vision in making our cities and suburbs smarter, more livable and more sustainable. This has been an excellent collaboration effort between councils, industry and universities, all facilitated by the governments of Australia. Overall, it was an honour and a privilege to work on this project. I hope you have enjoyed this video. In the next slide, the names of the participants in this project.